Who knew a kid from Bristol, Vermont, would become a figure in the nation's hip hop scene? Multi talented artist, poet, DJ, MC, designer, and businessman, Kyle Thompson, is my guest. Next on Profile. Here comes the W1, feel the vibration, soon to be heard on the radio stations. I could do the hip hop, shamrocks to bedrock, bump a bump, I make you jump and make your head rock. With the flow of my pencil line, I design me mine. Although Kyle Thompson grew up in rural Vermont, he has been instrumental in cultivating urban culture here for nearly two decades. Since the 90s, Thompson has toured America with a successful soul and funk group, opened a hip-hop art and clothing boutique, produced over 15 CDs, and is a legendary DJ at major venues in Burlington. His paintings sell internationally. It is my pleasure to welcome one of the most respected cats in the Burlington music and art scene, Kyle Fatty B. Thompson. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, so when did you fall for, for hip-hop, and how did you cultivate that in the little town of Bristol? It was funny. I, I was really young, 7th or 8th grade, and would listen to it quite a bit uh, in the locker room after practice. And Vermont is not a real, you know, hotbed for hip-hop music, so I was laughed at and made fun of, and as as the music and the scene started to evolve and become more popular, it was a little more accepted. So I was just into it real early and just kind of knew. I didn't know that I would be doing it or that I'd be touring, obviously, with a band, but I knew I loved it and something about it I was drawn to. Right. Because, yeah, you were a three-sport athlete. I was. And, I was. And, and so did, did, were, were, did family handle it any better than classmates, or it was... <laughs> my, my parents were kind of hoping it would go away a little bit, but <laughs> it ended up working out fine. And you started DJing pretty pretty early on. Very early. We, uh, we started a teen club when I was in high school to kind of keep kids out of trouble locally. Uh, three area high schools kind of got together, and we had a, a Saturday night event that went real well, and that kind of... Just realizing the power of a DJ to be able to bring people together and have a good time. I, I, I picked up on that, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. So, and, and it's one of your most visible personas today. I mean, you yeah. are still a, a major D, a DJ around town. You're at the helm of, of uh, Retronome. You have been for about 12, 12 years yeah. on Saturday nights, also Friday nights, and a couple other venues. What's the biggest high? What do you try to get at as a DJ at for me, uh, there, there's a couple different ways you can look at it. Uh, as the club owner will tell you, the idea is to, to keep people dancing and getting thirsty so they're going to want to consume some drinks. Um, for me, it's more keep everyone in a good mood. Let them kind of forget about the 9 to 5 grind, the daily trouble that they're going through. When you're out on a Friday or Saturday night, the last thing you want to think about is everything else that's on your mind all week. Mm -hmm. So it's just like relax, enjoy yourself. Here's some songs that you like to sing along to and dance to. And, Keep people moving. And, and you're standing there for what, four or five hours straight. It just doesn't stop. No, it doesn't stop. <laughs> Twelve years, it doesn't stop. <laughs> um, while a attending Champlain College, mm -hmm. uh, you uh, joined a band that evolved into Belezbaha, mm -hmm. uh, which was a, a great group that you toured with for, for seven years. This is the, the first album, uh, Charlie's Dream. Uh, it, it hit big pretty quickly. Real big. It was real big, real quick. We kind of weren't prepared. We didn't have um, a lot of material when we first started touring. We had to write on, on the go because we just, the draw was so large so quickly that we were being asked to play venues that were kind of out of our range. But we grew into it. And uh, the, the group was amazing as a whole, very diverse. The music was diverse. The, the people involved were diverse. And Blues Baha brought a lot of things to my life that changed me as a person. Mm. I, I got to see the country, and we went to Germany. I saw some other parts of the world that I would never have been able to see before Blues Baha. I had never been west of New York. So, you know, when you start traveling to the west coast four or five times a year and rolling around the country in a van. A way to see the world. It, it, you learn things pretty quickly about different types of people and acceptability and just... Did you like it for the most part? Or I loved it. I loved it. The traveling, I didn't like. It was we we did 250 shows a year for seven years, so we were we were heavy heavy touring. We we at that point that was before the internet age kind of took off. So 
that was the way to get seen and heard and try to blow up as a band was to just be on the road as many times as you could. We do two shows in a day sometimes, so that I didn't like as much. But the music and the interaction with the people, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And, and part of the inspiration was Charlie. Um, your mm -hmm. first CD was called Charlie's Dream. Yeah. Char who was Charlie? Charlie Willis was uh, a real close friend of a few of the members in the band. When we first started playing as a band, we started a band called Circadian Rhythm. This is just prior to Blizzbod. Charlie was a very integral part of that. He was an energetic, amazing person who I miss to this day dearly because he was killed in D.C. in uh, like I think it was 1991 or two. He went into a convenience store and uh, was writing a check, and a person asked him about his pen, which he had gotten as a graduation gift, and wanted to have the pen, and he refused. The man followed him out of the store, followed him down around a corner into an alley, and ended up shooting Charlie and shooting himself. It was tragic, unexpected, and it was real tough to get a grip on for us because we were he was two weeks away from coming back to school at UVM, and we were just preparing to start practicing to do some gigs in the fall, and... To get a phone call that he was dead was oh. one of the hardest things I've ever gone through. So, in a way, that was part of the inspiration for Belezbahan and, and yeah. What? When we went to his house for uh, his his funeral, he had a, his mom took us up into his room and he had a piece of paper that he had written when he was real young that he had tacked to the wall. Had been there for ten years. That said, uh, Charlie's dream is to be in a band. <laughs> and when we were trying to think of names for the CD, we had. A list of terrible names and when someone said we should just call it Charlie's Dream it was, we all knew right away oh. there it is so so the band takes off and, and among other things you uh, you're the MC the, the the rapper for the band you're um, you're rhyming and what was it like to play for like predominantly black audiences it was tough it was tough that I I saw a lot of uh, you know crossed arms and, and doubt and and just people not believing in me because you know, I was a white kid, uh, and they didn't necessarily know I was from Vermont, but if they did, it was worse. So it was always great for me, you know, a third of the way through the show or so, when I knew what I was, I was doing my thing, and I was confident about it. And I would look down and see them look and just start to nod their head a little. And by the end, for them to reach up and, you know, slap me five or just give me some respect, I knew I'd done my job. And I took it as a challenge. I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this crowd over to me. And, and you know, 90% of the time, it worked. Yeah. Well, let's see. The Canadian television did did um, re recorded you guys had had you on a, a morning breakfast mm -hmm. show, and I just like to see a little bit, just to see you in that role, which you're not doing as much anymore. But let's take a look. Okay. Let's take a with my mic control. You know what you want to see. Move the justice home. So take a beat, baby. Take notes. It's up to like a vote. My mind votes. Starts to reminisce to a first account. Say it to my mom, yo, I'm out of line. We keep the flow with like my pen is in motion. Toddy, let him go. We got the love motion. 98.63. Thank you, please. Now don't mind me. Hit me with the nose. Stop this in the middle of the house. With the most. Right. Who is that guy? Yeah, who is that handsome guy? <laughs> so give me a definition of hip hop culture. There's a lot of people think of violence and city and drugs and mm -hmm. misogyny and but it's much more than that well I mean it's where it's obviously it, it defines itself by where it's from and inner city hip-hop is very different than rural hip-hop and what some people call backpack hip-hop which is more mm -hmm. educated and, and college oriented so there's, there's many different sides as there is to any other type of music um, what we kind of tried to do with Belizbaha and with my music was more just having a good time similar to what I said before about DJing just make you forget about the day to day mm. and you know kind of connect with you on a level that wasn't as serious i had some songs that were of serious nature but the majority of the stuff was more laid back and just enjoy the music enjoy the groove yeah. well Belez Bahat tour uh, was touted as the next greatest thing with billboard magazine this mm -hmm. is in and but in 1999 on the verge of a big major label deal you guys disbanded it's not unusual but mm. were you were you crushed was it heartbreaking or kind of a relief it was a little of both. It was uh, because we were so close and we worked so hard. It was real tough to just give up on it. But we had been doing it for so long that the grind was beating us up. And we had two uh, sets of couples in the band that dated and didn't always get along. And when you're on the road that much together, it's real difficult to keep, you know, the level of friendliness <laughs> there. So 
we understood that when it was over, it was over. And we, mm -hmm. we took some time to like look back on it and just really appreciate it for what it was, which was an amazing ride. Right. You know, it, it gave us all so much. So, so and, and I'd like to, you to tell us a little bit about your, your moniker, Fatty B. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people have, or Bumbalodi. Bumbalodi? Yeah. Bumbalati. Bumbalati, sorry. Yeah. Um, and then shortened for Fatty, Fatty B. Where did that come from, and, and where's the comfort or discomfort around? <laughs> well, when I first started rapping, I wanted a name that rolled off your tongue real easy, especially for throwing it into the middle of rhymes. And Fatty Bumbalati doesn't get any easier than that, unless you're saying it. And then... <laughs> And then uh, people just shortened it after a while of, to Fatty B, just for the ease of saying it. And, uh, you know, I I used to weigh considerably more than I do now. So when I lost a lot of weight, uh, people were, they felt bad about calling me Fatty B. They're like, I don't know if I should call you that anymore. Yeah. But that's who I am, you know. So I, I like the nickname, so. Well, actually, that was a bit of a crisis. I mean, you got well over 400 pounds mm -hmm. at, at one point. Mm -hmm. um, so just tell us that. I, yes, it's pretty intense. Yeah, I, I came very close to dying. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I had congestive heart failure and uh, was in the hospital for a while. And the doctor said, if you don't change your way of living, you're going to be dead in five years. And this is when I was, you know, 32 years old. So that scared me, and it, it kind of put me in a different frame of mind. And just being as close to death as I was and being able to have a second chance, it makes you really take stock in everything a little more and appreciate life for what it is and every day. I mean, I wake up now sometimes and I'm tired and not feeling so great, but it's a quick reminder that it's not that bad. Right. You're, I'm not in a hospital bed. You're here. You're here. I can walk. I can talk. I can move around. So, um, yeah, I, I, I lost about 200 pounds and uh, I'm just grateful for another yeah, chance to, to live life the right way. And your lifestyle's a little, little different. A little different. Yeah, a little different. <laughs> Still up late night. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, right. Yeah, no, it's great. Everything's going well. Well, um, after the band, uh, you got off the ground, but you didn't slow down at mm. all. I think you you had a DJ gig for with a radio station right away. Mm -hmm. You had you had your club gigs. Uh, you had two more groups that you were emceeing for, um, yeah. IOU and um, Three the Hard Way. Mm -hmm. And then you and a, a friend of yours opened a boutique, a clothing boutique. Yeah, Steve's like, what was that about? Well, he he had been selling a few clothing lines um, from the distributors just to friends. He was friends with some of the guys who were starting clothing lines and was selling these clothes and needed a place to do it. And I did a small painting show at a bar called Red Square downtown and sold the show out and said, you know, what if I put some of these designs on shirts and hoodies and started to do it and people started to pick up on it. So we just opened this little tiny store. Uh, it was like 900 square feet in, on Main Street, and it took off. Were you thinking of this for the local crowd who doesn't get, like, hip-hop clothes or, or an international, or who knew? I didn't even know. I just I just thought that there was a calling for it and wanted to see where it would go, and it just snowballed. Well, let's talk a little bit ab about your art, which um, now sells internationally. It's an uh -huh. original sellout of a New York gallery. Your prints and posters sell all over the place. Like So... Had you been sketching all along? When did when did you start? I was painting? at a young age. I did painting and I drew a lot. Uh, then I kind of left it when I was doing the music thing for a while. And then when I was at Champlain College, I took some classes in Photoshop and kind of figured out. I'd always had a vision of how I wanted my art to look. I was really heavily inspired. Very Warhol. Warhol definitely, definitely inspired, and Keith Haring too. Uh -huh. The bold colors, real b bright bold lines, um, taking colors that wouldn't necessarily go with certain subjects and making them work. Uh, so when I took this Photoshop class, it really kind of brought it all together for me on how to do the designs. And then I was always able to take a, an image that I could look at and sketch it to proportion on a canvas. Uh. And I started working with acrylic pens and different media. And it just kind of all came together. And it's really, really snowballed into this amazing uh, opportunity for me to do gallery shows. I've done three or four gallery shows in New York. And the posters are distributed internationally. And it's just, it's a blessing. I'm really, really lucky that it's taken off the way it has. But I get text messages and phone calls from people all over the country saying, here's your poster in our dorm in California. And cool. Yeah, it's great. Well, I, 
I'd like to also just reiterate to people, these, these are, you paint these. These are acrylic paintings. They're original these paintings. These aren't just prints. They're original paintings. So right. do you, do you take them from a photograph? Or? I take a photograph into Photoshop and filter it and do some different effects to it to give it the color scheme that I want. Uh -huh. And then I draw that onto a canvas. And some of the artwork that, like you're seeing, we've taken and done prints of and turned into posters. Right. And those sell. Nationally, as prints and posters. <laughs> this is great. Of, of, <laughs> that one's of Obama. Great. I mean, what what kind of thing do you look for in the iconic images you choose to paint? Uh, it's, it really depends on what the show is calling for and where the show is. In New York City, it's a lot of like Warhol, Debbie Harry, JFK, really iconic city influenced people. It can be anything from music to pop culture. I go all over the map. I started out just doing DJ and and hip hop art. Right. But as I started to do more, you know, mainstream gallery shows, the curator would say, you know, you should really try broadening your spectrum and it's worked out great. Huh. It, it it is really interesting and some of the just uh, I mean, the Hepburn is so different, you know, why that one or the Yeah. It, it, very very interesting. And very smart guys, the retro, the metronome owners um, well, I think you suggested that the metronome was looking a little tired. Mm, yeah, and, we've been beat up over the years. Uh, this is a <laughs> club in Burlington right on Main Street. And uh, so you were you curated the whole renovation. You did the bar, the lights, and these amazing murals. These are, what, like 10 feet high murals. Yeah. You also painted your painting, your design, the lighting, everything. Tell us a little bit about that project. I, I've been working there for... 15 years now and just knew that the place needed a facelift and uh, had an idea in my mind of doing these musical icons mm -hmm. spread around the club, real visual, en enhancing the lighting, enhancing the bar, enhancing the sound. And I knew it was going to cost some money, but I said, you know, if you guys are really willing to put some money into this, you're going to see it pay dividends and it's worked out great. The people who come there every week love it and it's, it's enjoyable to go to work again there now. Yeah, yeah. And including, of course, Trey Anastasio is in there among exactly. all the other icons. You've also been producing records um, as on, on your Fatty B label mm -hmm. and uh, True North, um, I believe, the Hop series, uh, which was which is really terrific. I'll go through some of the here, here's a, here's a Hop mm -hmm. um, featuring local musicians. It was an incredible series, and a hundred percent of the proceeds went to the. Make-A-Wish Foundation. It was great. It was, it was, so I was, what was that about? Why did you do that? Well, when I started to do the first hop, I had no idea I would do seven volumes of it. But when we did the first one, it was more of a, of a venue or a, a vehicle for artists that had been recording stuff. Uh, and they wanted to be heard but had no way. They weren't playing gigs. They weren't. They didn't have any label connections. So it was me just like talking to people locally who had amazing tracks that wanted to be heard. I threw them all together. And I went around town to a bunch of businesses and said, if you can help me pay to produce these, there won't be any cost on our end, and we can take all the profits and just give it to a charity. Mm -hmm. And the charities we looked at, Make-A-Wish, stood out to me, you know, above and beyond all the other ones. And it's, I, I loved being able to do it, and I, I, I want to actually do some more volumes of it in the future and give some more money to them because I think it's a great organization. That's great. So businesses did also help you out. On yeah, they, they supplied all the money to pay for the printing of the disc. So, yeah, there wasn't any cost involved for me, and then we just took all the money that we well, made from... Well, and you didn't take any money either. Oh, no, no, it was a labor <laughs> it of love. Right, I mean, it, clearly. Yeah, no, it wasn't about getting paid for doing the work. The, the work was really enjoyable to put together, and, and now when I listen to them now, I still smile. I'm thinking about right. all the good that it did for the artist and yeah. for the, for yeah, the kids yeah. that the money went to. What is the secret of your staying power? I mean, hip hop is a competitive, youth-oriented culture, and you are still here and hot. Uh, and, um, I don't know. I I think I just I try to keep my ear to what's new, but I'm really an older an older cat who who enjoys the classics, and uh, I'm I'm a lot of my music that I play out, obviously with the '90s night and the '80s nights, are retro-oriented. So that kind of music always stays in fashion for the people who want to hear it. But even when I play newer sets at like the Green Room and other places that I DJ, I have a real soulful year to what I what I play. So even I have a lot of people who come up to me who aren't into hip hop music who say, I really like what you're playing. And I'm like, well this is hip hop, but it's got strings and it's got soul samples involved. So they hear stuff that they recognize. They don't really understand they're listening to hip hop. Oh. So I try to sneak it in there when I'm playing for a dinner crowd. I'm playing rap music. 
but they don't really understand that. They just like the groove and the vibe, and that's, you know what I'm saying? I try to read my audience and keep them up to date without them even understanding what I'm doing. <laughs> I love that. Um, so, and and there is something about the, that whole '80s and '90s music. You have this '70s and '80s kind of the disco era mm -hmm. piece. But what what are you slipping in there when you're doing a, a night like that? Are are, well, are you are you slipping it? Well, of course you're you're DJing, I, so that's from a hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. And finding that I've been doing it so long, there's definitely a set list that is played those nights that you don't really vary from. But I try to go online and and find remixes of those tracks so it freshens them up a little bit for people. Mm. You know, just keeping keeping that that genre of music fresh by changing up the way I'm playing it or the order of which I'm playing it and doing my best to to keep it coming for people and keep them coming back. Cool. That's the whole idea is to keep them coming back. <laughs> what were your your musical influences? We didn't really talk about that. Uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of rap music, a lot of sure. hip hop. Uh, when I was growing up, it was Run DMC for sure. I was real big into them. And then as I got a little older, it was like Tribe Called Quest. And I started to get into a lot of soul music. I liked Aretha Franklin, and Bill Withers, and uh, Marvin Gaye. And, I still to this day, like that's the kind of music that when I don't have anything else to listen to, I'll choose to put on some Bill Withers and relax with that on a Sunday, you know. It's just nothing better to me. Is it true that you went like to your friends' houses to see MTV because you didn't have that we at didn't home? didn't have cable. <laughs> so I would, before school, I would drive to my friend's house and annoy him and say, you know, I, I gotta watch this. Yeah. I couldn't <laughs> get enough of it. And what about now? What, what, what music are you listening to? What's. A lot of soul music. A lot of. Uh, I just started really getting into reggae music too. Um, I've been really trying to find uh, reggae remixes of old Motown songs, which to me is is great because it's a melding of kind of a laid back reggae vibe, but with Motown songs that I remember and love. Uh, stuff like that. I really like to find remixes that are something old made do. All right. And where is hip hop headed? Where? I don't know. It's 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 kind of tough for me right now. I'm not feeling the vibe of hip hop. I it, it got real commercial and and uh, it was like people have labeled a lot of hip hop now as ringtone hip hop, where it's just like popular for 15 minutes. People download it for their phone and then they forget about it. It's not really the staying power anymore. So I'm, I'm kind of interested to see where the next you know five or ten years takes it. Right, right. With the net and everything that's exactly. happening, it's just very different. Yeah. So it's interesting that it's your art that's really taking off yeah. and is getting international mm -hmm. interest. What do you think? What's what are your gallery people or what do you think about that? What's going on with that? I'm I'm really blessed to uh, to have the opportunity. It's it's all really kind of happened the same way the music did out of nowhere. Like one one opportunity opened the door to another and to another. And I'm just rolling with it. Uh, the gallery curator that I do the shows right now ongoing with in Brooklyn is going to be opening some galleries in Japan and really excited to be doing a show there in the next year or so. I think, I really think the Japanese style and my style go very well together. So I'm really kind of curious to see where that goes. Um, and with the, the company that distributes my posters, we're doing a whole line of Steve's items that's women's handbags, uh, shower curtains, Tapestries. We're, they 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 want to take it and roll with it and do a whole. Steez. What is Steez? Steez is your. Steez is the store name, and Steez is just kind of an urban slang term for style with ease. Mm. And it, a lot of uh, rappers in the mid '90s were using it in song lyrics, and we just wanted a one-word name that was real simple and remember, you know, you can remember it very easily. And Steez just stuck out. It uh, it works great. And that's. The name of your art and kind of you as the, as the artist. Right. And, and another name for you. So um, tell us about your both game. <laughs> Is that. <laughs> my That's friends, a trick question. My friends and I, the, I love golf. My friends and I uh, loved golf and didn't necessarily want to be paying greens fees and dealing with golf courses. We're a little more laid back than, than golf courses can be. And we invented a game that combines softball with golf. Uh, you toss up a ball and hit it with a bat, and then when you get to the green, we have putters, and the holes are proportional to golf balls, but you're using softball hole, soft balls themselves. And we have an 18-hole course on my friend's property, and we play three or four times a week when we can, and <laughs> it's addictive. And every one of my friends that I've taken up there to play wants to go back worse than I can imagine, and we're thinking about trying to open a golf bed and breakfast. <laughs> 
It sounds like you're taking very good care of yourself, and you're, and you're getting married. I'm getting so. married. I'm a, I'm a lucky man. My fiance is amazing, and we're the proud parents of a of a puppy, and everything's good. Everything is good. Any what what new projects on the horizon? Uh, Japan. Uh, yeah, a lot of art. I'm going to be doing a show in New York in uh, early 2011, and doing a bunch of new poster designs for the company as well, and still be steaming out DJing all over town. All right. Well, Kyle Thompson, um, it's Daddy B and Steez and all your other names. It's fantastic to have had you here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Kyle Thompson is an artist and DJ businessman. We have a link to his store site um, at vpt.org slash profile where you can find um, all kinds of good stuff. We are just about to hear him, uh, Fatty B, with Jennifer Hartswick, which was uh, uh, recorded uh, about four or five years ago or so, um, which is kind of cool as we're going out. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.